everyone, welcome to another episode of the Managing Violence podcast. My name is Joe Saunders, I'm your host each and every week as we go through the wonderful and tedious and terrible world of human violence and we unpack all there is to know and all there is to learn about the study of human violence on a practical, theoretical, academical, uh, that's not even a word, uh, Every level we can possibly think of, we are all about understanding human violence and how we can manage it, prevent it, and stay safe from it in our day-to-day lives. So today we are deviating from our uh, our format that we've been running with the past few weeks, uh, where we've had a lot of interviews up front. Uh, We still have plenty of interviews to come, don't worry, we're not abandoning that format altogether, but we're taking a quick break from it this week so that I can talk about a uh, subject that I have been asked about many, many times over. And I have uh, given various answers to this over the years. And uh, I thought, you know what? It's a good opportunity now to really put my thoughts uh, into a coherent response. And uh, it would make an excellent topic for a podcast. So for this week's episode, you have the tremendous pleasure of listening to my dulcet tones uh, as, as I go solo on uh, a very important topic of how can you find a good martial arts school for self-defense or what should I be looking for to determine whether this martial arts school that I'm thinking about is actually going to teach me information or teach me skills that might keep me safe from real violence and not just uh, being attacked by uh, wooden boards. So look, uh, if you haven't listened to the intro episode where I go through my background, please understand I am a lifelong martial artist. I love the martial arts in all their forms and facets. I will sit and talk and listen to anyone who has any martial arts experience in anything, even if I think it's completely useless for real violence. I still love martial arts. Uh, I love martial arts for so many different reasons. I love the form. I love the artistry. I love the history. I love the culture. I love the discipline. I love the values. I love the fact that it keeps you safe from real violence if it's done well. I love competition. Uh, I love combat sports. Uh, I'll have a crack at pretty much anything. So if you are offended by anything I say in this particular episode because you don't, you think it rules out your art, please understand that it is not a value judgment on your particular art in all ways. What I am going to be going through is what I think are the ideal circumstances for realistic self-defense training. So you're probably unlikely to find a school that hits all 12 of these points. And why is it 12 instead of 10? 10 is a nice round number. Uh, 12 was the number of points I came up with. So look, I would have loved to keep it to 10, but I think there's too many good ones in there and I I couldn't trim trim it back down. So, you know, uh, top 10, top 12, whatever. So, look, please don't take it personally. This is not an attack on any one art. It's really me trying to give the best advice I possibly can. If you're a martial arts school owner and you wanted to make your training more realistic, this is a good place to start. If you are a parent looking to get your teenager into something that will have a carryover to their own personal safety, these are things I think you should look for. As I said, I'm going through 12 separate points. If a school scores 8 or better... It's a really good school, and you should probably in, uh, invest in the training there. Uh, if they get less than that, it doesn't mean it's a bad school. Uh, it doesn't mean that uh, you, there won't be some tremendous value there. It just gives you more objective measurements so you can decide what's the best option available to you in your local area. And look, you might have three schools in your town, and uh, one of them scores a six, one of them scores an eight, and one of them scores a four, and, and now you know, okay, the eight, even though it's... Um, yeah, it's not a 12 out of 12, it's still significantly better than the other ones. And it's just a way that you can uh, you can objectively measure um, what, what's the best option for you, I guess. And uh, and not everyone has access to a 12 out of 12 school. In fact, there just aren't that many of them in the, in the world. Uh, so that, that's something that uh, we'll talk about as we go along as well. So once again, not a criticism of your martial art. Just because I don't think it's overly relevant to real violence doesn't mean that it's not uh, you know, a wonderful art and doesn't have a bunch of other redeeming values but uh, I'm going to be brutally honest here when it comes to what's good and what's not so um, please take it with an open mind if you're upset about it feel free to hit me up on Facebook and, and uh, send nasty letters if it makes you feel better that's totally cool uh, more than happy to talk to you about your art in fact you know what if you're really upset about it and you've got a relevant background and you make some interesting points I'll even have you on the podcast to tell me why I'm wrong 
no problems whatsoever. So, without further ado, I've always wanted to say that. It's very, uh, very Joe Rogan. Without further ado. So let's dive into the top 12, or my 12, or the only 12 things that you should look for to determine a good martial arts school for self-defense and real violence management. Now you'll notice that a lot of these are uh, to do with uh, everything except the style. In fact, I don't really mention the style at all. What I talk about a lot is the instructor, the students, the types of training that take place, and the general attitude the school has. So the instructor is the first and foremost point. Uh, in fact, this is probably a topic for another day, but um, one question I've been asked a lot over the years is what martial arts should I get my child into? And uh, one thing that I've uh, I find parents often uh, are surprised by when I give my advice is the style is far less important than the instructor. Uh, if the instructor doesn't understand how to teach kids, then really it doesn't matter what he's teaching them, it's not going to work. So uh, I really recommend that you, um, if you're in that boat, and again, that's a big sidetrack, that's, that's another topic altogether, but if you are looking for a martial art for your child, look at the instructor first, not the style. It doesn't matter about the style. As long as the kid's having fun, they'll enjoy it and they'll, they'll get something out of it. Uh, but if they're not, if they don't have a good instructor, they're not going to enjoy it and not going to get anything out of it and you're wasting your money. So moving back to the topic of the day. So the first point I've got is that uh, the instructor teaches self-defense as a priority. Now, what does that mean? Shouldn't self-defense be a priority for every martial arts instructor? Well, no, not at all. Uh, in fact, most of, most of my training life, I was training under instructors for whom self-defense wasn't a priority. Uh, it was something that was a nice byproduct of what we did, but it wasn't by any means the uh, main reason that we trained. Uh, main reason we trained for a lot of years was to win trophies and to win medals and to make national teams and to be fitter and to be healthier and to do all that great stuff. Uh, but self-defense wasn't really uh, on the list for a lot of my instructors. Now, for some of them it was, obviously, uh, because I ended up where I am. But uh, for a lot of for a lot of the time that I've been training, uh, my instructors were sporting coaches, whether that be judo, mixed martial arts, Brazilian jiu-jitsu, uh, wrestling, sumo, kyokushin karate. Um, you know, it goes on and on. I've competed in a lot of different combat sports. But uh, even the arts that started off as being self-defense focused. Let's take Brazilian jiu-jitsu for an example. Uh, I love BJJ. I've uh, been involved in BJJ now. Uh, my first class was 2006, so it's been 13 years now that I've been uh, on the mats in some capacity or another. A lot of long breaks in the middle, but yeah, uh, 13 years I've been involved in the sport. Uh, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu was supposed to be a self-defense art, and uh, the way that was constructed was based on match fighting uh, in Brazil. So um, I'm not going to go into the history of Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu just now, but uh, essentially Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu got its name from winning Vale Tudo fights, which is no rules sport fights, uh, or limited rules sport fights, uh, and challenge matches in academies and street fights on the beach, um, usually in a one-on-one -on -one context. So that's what Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu started off at, and uh, within those parameters, it was quite a good self-defense art. Now, the sport of Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu really started to take, uh, take effect in probably the late 90s. Uh, it, I do know there were sporting competitions as far back as the 70s at least, but, uh, but in the late 90s, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu as a sport started to pick up steam uh, because a lot of mixed martial arts competitors started to compete and there started to be a little bit more money involved. And uh, if you fast forward 20 years to today, sporting Jiu-Jitsu looks very, very uh, foreign compared to the original street violence jiu-jitsu. And this is a massive topic of contention within the jiu-jitsu community, so I'm not gonna dive into it right now. But my point is just that uh, I've worked with a lot of different Brazilian jiu-jitsu instructors over the years, and for some of them, their focus is entirely on sport grappling. Uh, for some, their focus was entirely on mixed martial arts. And for some, their focus was still on self-defense. So for the first point, the instructor needs to teach self-defense as a priority. So it doesn't mean that's the only thing they teach. Maybe they have a self-defense class as well as a sporting class. Maybe they um, uh, maybe maybe they, they they hedge their bets and they they focus on here's a here's a street solution to this technique and here's a sporting solution to this technique and that's that's totally fine too, as long as it's not an afterthought. So 
uh, for example, you can you can go and learn boxing, and, and boxing is a tremendous skill set for for combat uh, and and for defending yourself. Uh, but ninety percent of boxing coaches are going to be teaching for the ring, not for the ATM. So that's not necessarily a bad thing, uh, as long as they are putting some emphasis on this is how you would use it if you weren't wearing gloves and you're up against an unknown uh, assailant and the circumstances are not as clean as they would be if you're in a ring with a referee and time to prepare for the fight and you know you're in a fight and you have a corner man and you have a doctor watching and all those other stuff all that other stuff that you get in a sport fight that isn't or doesn't exist in reality so the instructor needs to teach self-defense as a priority Second point, the instructor has some understanding of real violence. This one will ruffle some feathers. The instructor needs to know what real violence looks like. And unfortunately, if you ask them if they know what real violence looks like, nearly everyone says yes. But the reality is that most instructors don't. Most instructors have never been in a fight. If you pursue teaching martial arts for a living, there is a very good chance that you're a nice person that you're probably quite a calm and placid person, that you are confident in yourself, and you avoid conflict. So unless you've had a job that has exposed you to conflict, uh, some of us have, then there's a very good chance you haven't been involved in much violence, uh, unless you grew up with it or had various other exposure. But because of that, a lot of instructors just do not have a great deal of understanding or exposure to real violence. And as I said in the episode two, I believe, where I talked about the truth of, uh, about surviving violence, that doesn't mean that every instructor should go out and get a night job as a bouncer so they get some experience with violence, although it wouldn't hurt some of them. Or maybe it would hurt them, maybe that's the point. But uh, it, the instructor should at least engage in their own personal study. So they should at least be trying to familiarize themselves with violence. And there are so many great resources now to do that. There are some fantastic YouTube channels that break down real attacks, real violence. Um, yeah, and, and not all of them are super gruesome either. It can just be sucker punches or it can be street fights. And you have really good instructors who are breaking down these videos and explaining what happened, where the, where the pre-contact indicators were, um, what signs were missed, and uh, even on a technical level, what techniques worked and what techniques didn't. So there's a lot out there that you can use to broaden your horizons. If you're an instructor listening to this and you realize that that's a shortcoming of yours, uh, feel free to hit me up. I'll point you in the right direction to some fantastic resources that can help you uh, improve that area of your training. But as a prospective student, you need to make sure the instructor has someone, some idea of what real violence looks like. Okay, that they don't think the violence looks like a martial arts demonstration or they don't think it looks like a kung fu movie or they don't think it looks like a John Wayne movie. They need to know what it looks like, what it tastes like, what it smells like. Uh, if they listen to this podcast, that's a really good start. So uh, if, if you're going to walk out the door, please uh, please tell them to, to listen to the podcast and you'll come back in three months. That'd be tremendous. Thank you. But um, this is this is really important. They can't teach you how to prepare for violence if they don't know what violence is. I'll just state that again. They can't teach you to prepare for something if they don't know what that thing is. They can't teach you how to swim if they've never been in the water. And they must, must, must be very consciously aware of their own shortcomings in that understanding. And that goes for everybody. I mean, I, I look my my uh, my intro on this show announces me as a violence management specialist, but I'll be quite honest. I didn't grow up in a violent home. I studied violence uh, by choice. I I threw myself into this because I found it fascinating. I have a different level of understanding of violence to someone who grew, grew up with it and had to learn how to survive with it and had to make sure they didn't get killed uh, six times each week. And I have a different understanding from someone who is worried that their family is going to be, uh, their family homes can be ransacked and their uh, siblings are going to be captured and tortured for the religion they follow. I have a very different understanding of violence to those people. Uh, and I have to be honest with my own limitations in, in what I understand. And uh, part of this podcast for me is being able to defer to experts who understand violence in different ways than what I do. 
uh, and, and get their viewpoints and, and engage with them and to learn from that. So coming back to our point, the instructor has to have an understanding of real violence and have an, a, a level of self-awareness on what their understanding is and what their limitations are in that, in that realm. All right, point number three. The instructor understands self-defense law and teaches multiple force options as appropriate. All right. This is a good uh, black and white, yes or no, uh, I guess, uh, criteria that you can apply. You can ask an instructor to, uh, to explain to you what the self-defense law is in your state or your county or your country or your jurisdiction or wherever your laws work, wherever you are, that, uh, wherever you live. If they can't adequately explain to you what the self-defense laws are, how much force you can use to defend yourself, and under what circumstances, then that is a cross in the box. They need to know how... They need to know the legal framework, because good self-defense that gets you put in jail is not good self-defense, because self-defense should be about keeping you safe, and there are a few places in the world where you are less safe than in jail. So... Just learning physical skill sets without understanding the legal framework about where you can apply this and how you can apply it, that is a recipe for disaster. And to be honest, you'd be better off not knowing anything at all. So this is a really key point. The instructor must understand self-defense law for your state. This is important. For your state, the law does differ. Even here in Australia, state to state, even though it's more or less the same, the principles are the same, the wording is different and the implications are different. So we need to understand how that works. Uh, if you're here in Australia and you're looking for an instructor and, and they're talking about uh, US law, uh, that's that's a big warning sign. Okay, If they're thinking that their legal framework for what they're doing is the same as it is in the United States, whew, man... You're, they're going to, they're in for a rude surprise if they're ever called up as a witness. So educate yourself on that first and foremost and use that as a test that you can throw at the instructor and say, what do you know about self-defense law in X state? The second part of that was that they teach multiple force options as appropriate. So let's say they understand that uh, there are uh, limitations on how much force we can use in certain circumstances. If they give lip service to that, but then the answer to every technical problem is just punch them in the head. That doesn't really show a comprehension of how the law works. So this is a, again, it's a, it's a show I'd like to do, or a topic I'd like to cover in a future show about uh, the pros and cons of having multiple, multiple response options to various threats. The more options we have to deal with a particular situation, the slower our response time is. That's a phenomenon called Hicks Law. Uh, Hicks Law basically states that the uh, the processing time required to come up with a solution, uh, it directly relates to how many solutions we have available to us. So, in theory, having one technique or one response to a particular threat will make your response time much quicker. However, not everything that looks like a threat is a threat and there are so many human factors and variables that can change the level of the threat that will dictate a different level of response every martial artist has a counter to a right haymaker so a big right looping punch it's the most common punch thrown in every fight ever most martial artists have some idea how they'll defend against it commonly you'll see they either close the distance and clinch, or they take down, or they block and punch, or they block and kick, or they parry and punch, or something similar. Let's say that my response to a looping overhand was to jam it and throw a right cross to the chin. Sounds fair, punch for punch. Punch equals punch, that sounds like a reasonable force. No problem. That is assuming that the person who is attacking me is the same as me. That they're, for, for my case, they're a large, angry male. Then punch for punch sounds more than reasonable. What if the person punching me was a 13-year-old girl? And here I am at 6 foot 3, 125 kilograms, and I just punched her in the face. Does that still sound like reasonable force? It's a punch versus a punch, but it's not really the same, is it? What if it's my own mother? 
and and you know people scoff and laugh at this and go oh, my mum wouldn't do that or you know you've got family problems or you know what I've seen some sweet lovely people have mental health issues and have moments of psychosis and tried to hurt the people that love them the most and that is an awful situation to be in um I personally know someone who uh, his wife had a psychotic episode and attempted to stab him with a large shard of broken glass and he was a trained martial artist and after running away from her in the inside the house for a long period of time he ended up having to knock her out because it was the only thing he could do to save his own life and he suffered tremendously emotionally with the fact that he had to make that decision. So don't rule out the fact that it won't always be the stereotypical big, ugly male in a balaclava that's going to be the one attacking you, and you need to have different force options. So yeah, maybe you do need to have a deflection option where you just uh, protect yourself, create space, and get away. Maybe you need to have a an option where you can put the person down quite quickly, like with a, the right cross to the jaw. Maybe you need to have a takedown and control option as well. And it really depends on, on how long you're willing to train as to uh, how well developed these responses need to be or, or how many responses you should have. But the instructor should at least have the ability to teach you uh, different levels of force for different threats and also uh, understand the importance of having different responses available to you. Uh, again, tying back into that legal framework. All right, point number four is a quick one. The students, you, sorry, majority of the students appear to be in decent shape. Why is that important? Well, it'll give you an idea of, of what emphasis the, uh, the instructor puts on physical fitness. Now, if we tie back into episode two, where I was talking about the truth about surviving violence, the second most important thing, the second most important factor on that violent survival pyramid was physical fitness. Now, obviously, your beginner students uh, this, this doesn't apply to them so much. If, if the white belts are a bit out of shape, that's cool. They're starting out. But if you've got uh, brown belts and black belts uh, or the equivalent in whatever style you're looking at that uh, are out of shape, well, you know, there's a bunch of other factors. There, there, there's life that happens. You might have someone who's coming back from a long training break. You might have someone who is recovering from a surgery. You might have, There might be a thousand reasons why someone's out of shape, but it shouldn't be the whole class. If the whole class look like, looks like they're out of shape or they couldn't do 10 push-ups, then uh, you have to consider whether what they're learning has any basis in reality whatsoever. So that's just another big red flag for me. If, everyone looks, if no one there looks like they can fight, <laughs> chances are what they're learning isn't very useful. Uh, and that's a, that has proved itself over and over again every time I look at a different martial arts school. Okay, moving on to the drills. So point number five... Your drills, and drills being your practice, uh, it doesn't have to be you know, a set drill, but practice, whether it be technique practice or uh, scenario replication or, uh, or various sort of creative uh, skill set drilling, should involve contact. So drills must involve contact. Not all the time. Not every drill needs contact. And uh, I certainly think there's a case for beginning students to not have contact because the last thing we want is for someone who is... Uh, relatively unskilled and unprepared to become punch shy that is they get hurt they don't know what happened and therefore they become shy of being hit again uh, and that stops them from learning uh, very important skill sets so I think uh, we need to draw the line somewhere uh, in keeping beginning students safe but there should be an element of contact in your drills so that they you need to get used to being hit it doesn't mean you need to get used to being smacked full force in the head but there should be at least some, be some contact on the pads, some contact to the body. There should be some uh, light uh, feedback if you left your head exposed, all those sorts of things. So without contact, there's no fighting. If you're not training with contact, you are not training for fighting, period. I don't care what excuses you use. If you're not training with contact, you are not training for fighting. All right, point number six, almost halfway. Classes include sparring. I'm just letting that one sink in. I just got half the Krav Maga industry attacking me in their minds right now. Yes, 
classes include sparring. This is an interesting one. For years and years and years, I have heard martial artists, uh, traditional martial artists, reality-based martial artists, combatives martial artists, saying, we can't spar, our stuff is too dangerous. I'd kill somebody if I use these techniques, so therefore I can't possibly spar. I have to practice them in a different way. I can't spar with somebody. I'll collapse their kneecap and cripple them and collapse their windpipe and I would break their necks and I'm too dangerous for sporting sparring. And to that, I say to you, bullshit. The main reason people don't spar is because they find out that what they think is going to work doesn't work and they can't handle that. They think that... Uh, they're going to be this lethal weapon and it turns out they have no timing, they have no distance, they have no power generation and they can't make it work. And they're getting hit in the head a lot. And that is really, really brutal for an inflated ego to take. So therefore, they don't spar anymore. Now, does that mean that you should be sparring with your full force sidekick to the knee? Or that you should be sparring with your throat strikes? Or that you should be sparring with uh, neck breaking techniques or that you should be applying arm locks at full speed, full volume, full force? Of course not. That's stupid. But if you are not sparring at all, you are not learning the most essential elements of fighting, which is timing, distance, and power. If you don't know how to control distance, you don't know how to fight. If you don't know how to time your attacks, you don't know how to fight. If everything you do is static against a partner who is essentially being a human ragdoll, then you will only ever get good at fighting human ragdolls. And unless you're intending to go pick a fight with a scarecrow, uh, that's not really going to help you. you. Real human beings move. And if we're talking about self-defense, then that real human being is attempting to hurt you. And if you don't know how to make your stuff work against someone who's attempting to hurt you, then it's not real. And it doesn't work. It's useless. It's worse than useless because you thought it was going to work. Super important point. You must include sparring. Now, I've heard... I'm going to address this because because I'm a Krav Maga instructor and there are a lot of Krav Maga instructors that say, well, Krav Maga doesn't include sparring. Nonsense. If you talk to anyone in the IDF, Krav Maga includes sparring. They have sparring competitions. They have Krav Maga competitions. Yes, there are sporting elements to Krav Maga. The reason for that is exactly what I just stated. They realize the training benefit of the sparring outweighed uh, whatever uh, limitations there may be in in slapping some rules on, on what we can and can't do. So, yeah, when you put headgear on, it changes things. When you put body protection on, it changes things. When you put boxing gloves on, it changes things, no doubt. But the benefits you get from being able to go full force, full contact with timing, distance, and power far outweigh whatever limitations you may have just uh, added on in the name of safety. And if you want any proof of this from martial arts history, check out the the history of judo. When uh, when judo was formed, the short version is that uh, Jigoro Kano uh, took what he knew of jiu-jitsu and eliminated a lot of the techniques that were too dangerous to practice at full speed. And the reason he did that is that he felt that there was more personal development from training at full speed uh, with intensity than what there was in static practice. And uh, he wanted to be able to do that. So judo took away a lot of the battlefield techniques from jiu-jitsu. So a lot of the joint breaking was gone, the lethal techniques were removed or restricted to kata the striking techniques were removed or restricted to kata and what was left were techniques that you could train at full intensity with training partners and not kill people now when they eventually had challenge matches against the top jiu-jitsu schools at the time the thought was that the jiu-jitsu schools would have an advantage because not only did they have heritage and they had a reputation but they also had all these lethal techniques but the problem with lethal techniques is that you can't practice them against live sparring resisting opponents 
So in the absence of uh, regular wars to fight, they just didn't really get a chance to actually practice these techniques. So while the judoka of Kano uh, arguably didn't have as much proficiency, arguably, with the, at the lethal techniques, the techniques that they did have access to, they were more than adequately prepared to, to perform those techniques against live resisting opponents. And they decimated the jiu-jitsu schools because of that. They were better athletes, they had better timing, better control of distance, better power. Their techniques were refined to work on an actively resisting violent human being. So, and that comes through sparring or randori or whatever you want to call it in your particular system. Matt Larson, who I had on last week, uh, I can't recall if he said it during this interview or if it was another interview I heard with him while I was doing my prep for that interview, but uh, he said outright, it, even as the father of modern army combatives, if your system doesn't involve sparring, it is bullshit. And I'm sorry that if that hurts your ego, but if you don't spar, you need to think about why. Yes, there, are, there is a potential for injury. Yes, some techniques shouldn't be practiced at full speed uh, in a you know, live setting with class, mem- class members and, and look, we're all recreationalists to some level. We all have to go to work the next day. So don't use those techniques. But take the techniques you can practice and put them into some live resisting rounds of sparring. You'll be amazed at what you learn about your system. Moving on. Point number seven. All ranges of combat are taught to some level. Alright. All ranges of combat. (laughs) Now, I haven't said that every system has to be proficient or highly proficient at every level. But, uh, sorry, at, at, at every range rather. But just that they need to acknowledge that those ranges exist. So what does that mean? Well, okay, so starting from furthest away, the first range of combat is a projectile range. So this is outside of kicking range. The person can only harm you if they are throwing things at you or shooting at you. Okay, that's a projectile range. Then you move into a weapon range. Okay, so they could hit you if they had something, had a weapon in their hand, so a stick or a baseball bat or whatever. Then you move into kicking range where they can, they can reach you with a kick. And then you're into punching range where they can punch you with, with power. And then you're into the clinch range where you've got elbows, knees, headbutts, and also your clinch fighting, throws, takedowns, etc., joint locking. And then you have the ground range. And the ground range is, obviously, you're on the ground. So you're looking at throws. Sorry, not throws. You're looking at uh, strangles, arm bars, leg locks, controls, grounded punching, ground and pound, all that sort of jazz. So those are the different levels. Sorry, different ranges of combat. Now, some systems are going to be more proficient at one range than another. Let's take judo. We're just talking about judo. Judo is highly proficient at the clinch range, highly proficient at the ground range. Not so proficient elsewhere. That's totally fine. That's a different... uh, That becomes a strategic decision for a judoka. If I was going to teach judo purely as a self-defense system, I'm not going to say, let's engage at the kicking range. I'm going to be saying, here's how we deal with the kicker. Or here's how we close the distance from the kicking range into a punching range. Here's a couple of strikes we can use to set up our clinch. And then once we're in the clinch, we're home and hose because this is our skill set. Uh, I will acknowledge those those ranges of combat exist. Uh, I don't have to spend a whole lot of time on them, but I have to acknowledge they exist. The fights happen at different ranges. Similarly, you'll find that... Uh, some karate practitioners or, um, or various other striking styles, Taekwondo or Muay Thai or whatever, they want to practice exclusively at the range that they're comfortable at, which is the punching and kicking range, without acknowledging that there is a clinch range, Muay Thai accepted. Uh, and, uh, and if the clinch doesn't go well, there's also a ground range. And, uh, well, if you need to know how that goes, go look at the first 20 UFCs and... Uh, you'll see what happens when people who are unaware of the ground end up on the ground with someone who is good at fighting on the ground. So, very important that uh, they at least acknowledge that there are different ranges of combat and they have a a strategy for either fighting at all ranges or at least getting from the range that you're in to the range that you want to fight at. Alright, point number eight. 
Drills and scenarios resemble reality and include realistic variables. Now, not every drill has to resemble reality. Obviously, my classes, my Gendai Krav Maga classes, they are designed for realistic self-defense. That said, I will do drills that just uh, illustrate technical purposes. So if one drill we do is a, is a zombie line where you literally have people walking at you with their arms outstretched and that's because we use that to demonstrate arm drags or to practice getting reps in arm drags. And we do a similar drill where people walk into throws and so on and so forth. Not every drill has to look like a real fight. However, there must be drills and scenarios that do look like real fights, that do look like reality. And especially when it comes to your scenario replications, that's where you really have a chance to play with reality. So uh, I mentioned there that they must include realistic variables. Now, some of the realistic variables that we're talking about, they're, they're not just, oh, it's a big person or it's a little person, although that, that's, a, that's, a, that's a good variable to play with, but also things like, is there a weapon involved? Uh, or do we know there's a weapon involved? You should always assume there could be a weapon involved. But uh, do we know there's a weapon involved? Or do we have cause to believe that we know there's a specific weapon involved? Uh, is, there, um, uh, is, there, is there multiple people? So is it, is it one-on-one or is it one guy with a friend who doesn't look interested? Is it one guy who has a bunch of friends that are all chomping at the bit to get involved? Um, how far away is my backup? Do I have friends? Do I have loved ones? Do I have people that are useful that are coming to save me? Am I in a place that has security where they're coming to break up the fight and I've only got to survive the next 15 seconds and then the whole thing will be broken up? Or am I completely on my own and I'm going to be fighting for my life for at least a couple of minutes? Those are variables we need to control. Uh, what is my surrounding? Uh, it's probably not going to be in a martial arts studio. I'm probably not going to be getting jumped on nice soft mats with no shoes on and, and all the... And the nice luxuries of fighting in a dojo, there's a good chance that I'm going to be on bitumen. Or what? If, what if it's not bitumen? What if it's grass? Does that change things? What if I'm in? A, what if I'm at the beach? Does that change things? What if I'm on the road and there's cars? Does that change things? Absolutely, of course it does. Now we've got. To, now we've got to get off the road as quickly as we possibly can in case someone runs us over. Even if we do manage to fight off a person, it's hard to fight off a minivan. So we need to look at those sort of variables. And then a lot of people get really good at at dealing with those sorts of variables, but then we throw in some that uh, we really start to play with the human factors. So now you, what if you're, uh, you have a situation where you've got your niece or nephew with you or your child with you or your little brother or your little sister with you, uh, how are you going to handle this situation now? A physical response may be not the best option. Or maybe now that physical response is the only option because You've got a seven-year-old with you who can't run as fast as you can, so fleeing may not be available to you. Maybe now you have to put the person down hard. Uh, Or maybe you're pushing a wheelchair with your 90-year-old grandmother. So how do you manage a self-defense situation when you're stuck to someone who's immobile? Or maybe you're just walking home with a bunch of drunk friends and your drunk friends are antagonizing people around them. Uh, so you're trying to apologize for your friend, but also keep them safe and also keep yourself safe. And how do you deal with that if that drunk friend gets involved in the fight? How do you carry their lifeless body while still fighting for your own safety? There's a thousand different variables we can play with, and this is where real violence happens. It's not being fanciful. We're actually being realistic. Uh, because it's not enough to say, well, you're, uh, you know, your right cross is coming along really strong and uh, you're your penetration step and uh, your, your covering distance into your double leg takedown is, is getting really good because if you don't have a delivery system for those skills, then they do not say, serve you in any way in self-defense. So we need to consider those variables. Uh, there's no point doing a double nice double leg takedown if uh, it puts us on the ground with five other people are going to stomp our head in because we're in enemy territory and we're surrounded. Uh, believe me, I've been there, I've done that, I've taken people down and then copped a kicking because of it. So um, let, please take that lesson from my experience and don't have to go and learn it yourself. It's a bad idea. But uh, the point was the drills and scenarios must resemble reality. And, and you play with variables. Not not every situation, not, not every scenario has to be the worst possible circumstance. But you need to introduce them occasionally. Make a two-on-one, make a three-on-one. Um, maybe maybe you stack some odds in your favor. Maybe you've got a really aggressive person coming at you, but they're on their own and you've got three friends. 
that doesn't mean that, in fact, those are good scenarios because uh, you have to fight the human urge to go, wow, the odds are in my favor now, I'm going to give you a beating because uh, that's not really the sort of thing we want to be training and it's not the sort of person we want to be creating. So, but let's see how those power dynamics shift. Okay, what if it's a, if you're a male student, what are you going to do if it's a female who's picking a fight with you? How do you respond to that? Uh, and and same thing, uh, women's classes tend to fo- focus so much on uh, a male on female violence for you know, for good reason. Statistically, it's the right thing to do. But uh, what happens if it's a female who's picking a fight with you? How does that change things? Okay, and, the, and the nature of the attack is going to be different and the social dynamics are going to be different. People are less likely to break up a fight between two women uh, than they are between a man and a woman. Typically, when two women fight, everyone ste- steps back and watches as opposed to breaking it up or, or coming to your aid. So that, those variables need to be considered. So you can see, like again, we could do a whole show on just the different variables you can add into scenario training. But uh, it's it's something that instructors need to pay attention to if they're trying to do a re- realistic self-defense training is, is how many variables do we introduce and, uh, and how do we get this as close to reality as possible so our students get good at making decisions under pressure. Okay, point number nine. At least some portion of the class is spent actively training pre-contact skills. So, at least some portion of the class is spent actively training pre-contact skills. Now, what am I talking about with pre-contact skills? Pre-contact skills are everything that happens before you make contact with your assailant. So, as martial artists, we are incredibly guilty of spending all our training time working on fighting. And we don't really spend a lot of active training time working on not getting into a fight. Uh, And there's reasons for that. And First and foremost, um, the fighting skills, the combative skills, take the longest time to acquire. It takes the longest time to get good at. So it makes sense to spend the most time in the class on those skills. Uh, It's also the fun stuff. So people tend to come to martial arts classes wanting to break a sweat, wanting to get some... Yeah, some fun and games and a little bit of contact and you know, and and have some fun. So uh, yeah, we, we spend time doing the fun stuff, but sometimes we do that too much and we neglect the most important part, which was not getting into the fight in the first place. So <laughs> I, I can be guilty of this as well. Like, I, I love teaching this stuff, but it, it can be monotonous teaching people how to stand, how to move, how to use their hands, how to uh, how to de-escalate uh, and. It, it, it sometimes it's it's hard as an instructor when you can tell that students are you know they're getting cold and they they don't want to be standing there doing talking drills they want to be doing fighting drills uh, but you know that the thing the skill set they most need to work on in this particular moment is how to talk their way out of a situation how to uh, set up an exit um, good personal security uh, skills to be able to get away from a situation and, and this is again tying back into the previous point is uh, is why I like to play with those variables such as you're pushing your 90 year old grandmother because now it doesn't matter how good your front kick is you've got to get out of there without fighting because your grandmother is going to be hurt so uh, sometimes the scenarios do uh, create the opportunity to really explore those pre-contact skills in, in greater depth uh, with a more engaged student base but if you're if you're going to check out a martial arts school and the instructor spends no time at all actively training pre-contact skills, that's something to be mindful of. Okay. Now, you I, I, just pay attention to the language I used. I said actively training, not just talking about. Growing up, I had quite a number of martial arts talks where I had, a, had an instructor talk about not getting into fights and trying to talk your way out of it and. Um, you know, uh, trying trying to walk away from violence and and all that sort of jazz, but no one actually trained us in how to do it. It was just do it. Just make sure that you don't get into fights. Well, how? It is a fine motor skill. Talking is a fine motor skill, and being able to find the right words and play the right games and understand the psychology of violence and aggression informs your ability to be able to talk your way out. And until you've practiced it under pressure, then you can't do it. So. Uh, it's very important that their stuff is actively trained, actively trained, not just talked about. Point number 10. The instructor talks at least occasionally about post-contact incident management. All right, post-contact. 
So we just talked about pre-contact. And I think pre-contact needs to be actively trained on a regular basis. Post-contact is not so much something you can train. It's just something we have to be aware of. So post-contact is everything that happens after the fight. Now, in the immediate sense after the fight, that can include things like uh, self-first aid. So checking yourself for wounds, uh, injuries, uh, giving yourself a pat down, making sure you're not bleeding anywhere, making sure you haven't been stabbed, uh, potentially you know, performing first aid on your uh, on anyone else who's around, maybe even first aid on the assailant. Uh, if you've neutralized them uh, sufficiently and you feel that, they're, that, you, that you can control them safely now, you may even start commencing first aid on them if you think it's appropriate, especially if, uh, if it's an occupational setting, so you're a, you're a police officer or a security guard or something, and your backup has arrived, and now it's fairly safe for you to be able to work on the assailant um, you know, w- without you being compromised. So uh, th- that's the immediate post-incident. Uh, and that can include things like, for, for civilians, it might be, um, so post-incident, what does it look like when the police arrive? What are they going to do? Uh, are they going to take statements? Are they going to talk to you? Are they going to separate you from your loved ones? Are they going to separate you from your friends that you've just been leaning on for support? Chances are they will, because they want an unbiased um, statement of events, uh, and they don't want to talk to people who weren't there and they certainly don't want you talking to other witnesses and comparing notes. So if you're not prepared to be separated, that can be quite unsettling. Um, people get upset about that. And so a good instructor should prepare you for that. Uh, what happens if you get arrested? And just because you've been arrested doesn't mean you're a bad guy. It could just mean, especially if the fight is ongoing, when the police arrive, they will usually arrest everybody just for safety. And they'll put everybody in cuffs and figure out what happened later okay and if you react badly to that that can set up a really negative chain of events so if you start fighting off the police and protesting your innocence uh, and resisting arrest now you have problems okay they, they were arresting you first for their own personal safety and just for general admin essentially uh, and now you're actually got an active resisting arrest charge that you have to personally defend so don't do that uh, but it's very important that instructors are aware of teaching this sort of stuff. So um, once once we're back at the station, how do we make statements? Who do we contact? How do I get a hold of a lawyer? What what if I don't have a lawyer? Who do I get to call? Uh, what are my rights? Am I going to be charged if I'm not, if I'm not going to be charged? So all those sorts of things. Uh, if if I'm teaching security guards or police, we'll talk about how to write a good incident report. Uh, we'll talk about how to uh, how to access counselling and support services afterwards, uh, or internal affairs, or unions, or w- whatever is appropriate for their particular uh, their particular situation. But that's all post contact, um, and that's in the immediate. You know, that's the immediate twenty four hours after. Now we talk about things like what what can happen. The violence isn't over. If you listen to my my interview with Rory Miller, we said violence isn't over when you want it to be over. Violence is over when all parties agree that it's over. So if you if you engaged in violence with somebody, that doesn't mean that situation is over for them, especially if they lost the fight, quote unquote, lost the fight. If you embarrass the wrong person, then they might come looking for you again. Do they know where you live? Can they find out? Probably. There's probably a good chance they can they can find out where you live. Um, they might find out where you can work, where you work. They might just key your car, or maybe they're going to throw a brick through your window, or maybe six months from now you're going to end up face to face with the same person again, who's this time has come armed because they're defending what they perceive to be a, a, a slight on their honour because they were embarrassed last time. So. This is what makes violence so ugly. It's not glorified like the movies. It's not a martial arts demonstration. It's real and it's ongoing and it can cripple you for life because you are dealing with a tremendous amount of stress uh, and it doesn't end when you want it to end. It's not a symbol of uh, you you scored a knockout and you uh, therefore win and he's going to respect that you are the superior fighter and that's the end of it. Uh, Very seldom is that actually the case. So... Uh, we need to deal with post-contact skills uh, and, and, and getting your quality of life back after after that, that um, those sorts of incidents. And I believe a good self-defense instructor should be able to assist you with that. And not many people out there have that depth of knowledge. And this, that's why I said it's very, very rare to find a school that will tick all 12 of these boxes, but these are still boxes you should be looking to tick. Uh, and uh, 
certainly I think that's that's a valid point that they need to be able to talk about post contact incidents at least occasionally. Okay, uh, number eleven, second last item on the list. So again, this one I think is probably going to upset some people. So please send the hate mail to my Facebook account. That's totally cool. I can always turn off notifications if you're being ridiculous. So the uh, the instructor or the academy actively seeks to learn from the outside and or test themselves in competition. Now, for, if you're new to the martial arts, then you may not understand why this is a controversial statement. But historically, many martial arts have had a very closed door policy in that students are not allowed to cross train. They're not allowed to go train with anybody else. They're not allowed to learn from anybody else. They're not allowed to study anything else. They have to stick to the one art. And if they leave that art, then they're essentially blackballed and not welcome back. Now that stifled the growth of martial arts. And this is one of the things that Bruce Lee was actively rebelling against as far back as the 1960s. But uh, what that was largely about was insecurity. Uh, it was a, it was martial arts uh, instructors fearing that if a student found a different instructor who might know more than them, that they would then lose that student and hence the source of income. Uh, whereas instructors who were, uh, I guess, had more um, honesty and integrity uh, and were more concerned about the welfare of the student would uh, would actively encourage people to cross train and go learn some more skills. And in fact, go learn the skills and then come back and teach them to us so that we can all benefit. Uh, and that was certainly the uh, the way the martial arts has moved in the last 20 years or so, with uh, especially with the advent of mixed martial arts. And now, now everybody seems to cross-train in everything, although yeah, not quite everybody. But uh, I do find in the uh, reality-based self-defense world, where you'll find a lot of these schools that start to tick these boxes, uh, they can be quite switched off, and they don't want to learn from someone else. And, and this... Um, it's, it's almost like a breed of elitism that there's nothing that I can learn if I'm a Krav Maga guy I can't learn anything from an Aikido guy because Aikido is not good for real fighting okay that's valid to a degree but let me tell you something there are things you can learn from Aikido Aikido might not be where I will go to pressure test my techniques but I can learn a lot about joint manipulation I can learn a lot about uh, s small circles and footwork and uh, close quarters manipulation of body weight there, there are things I can learn from Aikido that I can then apply back to my Krav Maga or to my Jiu Jitsu or to my Judo or to my Muay Thai for that matter so there, there are things I can learn from every art um, right now uh, I, for, for a lot of years I used to uh, slander Taekwondo uh, when I was younger less mature uh, because Taekwondo had a reputation of being fairly ineffectual in, in real fighting especially modern sport Taekwondo um, now my striking coach is a fourth degree black belt in Taekwondo because I recognize that uh, one of my major weaknesses as a martial artist is my kicking and I used to have pretty good kicks but my, my technic, uh, technical ability at kicking is, is uh, substandard so I've sought out a high-level Taekwondo practitioner, and uh, and I'm training it because even though Taekwondo may not may not form the basis of my self-defense system, there is still a lot I can learn from a Taekwondo black belt about kicking. So uh, that's something that um, that instructors should be open to. And and how can you tell that as a student? Well, things like does the instructor bring in people for seminars? Do they bring in experts? Do they welcome guest instructors from other styles to come in and teach a class? Uh, and and that, that's something that can be so hugely beneficial for an instructor that has uh, uh, a sense of security in their own self-worth. Being able to bring in instructors from other neighboring schools and say, you know, this, uh, this Thursday we're going to have uh, Paul from the local karate club come in and do a session on um, you know, kicking or, or blocking or whatever, uh, whatever skill set might be relevant. That can be hugely beneficial for the students and for the club, okay? and it can be reciprocal because then the instructor can go and teach at that club the following week, and and uh, and now you've actually upskilled a whole bunch of people. So, uh, I think that's incredibly beneficial, and it and it shows a certain level of maturity, and it also shows that they are placing the students' best interest at the forefront, not their own business interest necessarily. Although I would argue that it's also good for business. Uh, and the last point I made, sorry, not the last point, but the the second part of that point was. 
uh, they they and or test themselves in competition. Now again, this this ties right back to the sparring thing. So many reality based martial arts and traditional martial arts going. We're not a sport. We don't do sport. We are self defense, or we are combat, or we are real. We don't do sport. Uh, and I just roll my eyes at that because you're basically saying that uh, I'm not good enough to compete under sporting rules, and uh, that that's reality. That's realistically what it is. Uh, if you are a Japanese jiu-jitsu school that may, might be focused on self-defense, but you still train throws, takedowns, groundwork, ground position, arm bars, strangles, what is the harm in you going and entering a grappling competition? What's the harm in you doing a judo competition? Find out where you stack, where you stack up. And unfortunately, uh, the main reason that people don't do that is because they don't want to find out that they stack up at the bottom. They don't want to find out that what they have been practicing doesn't work all that well, and it's not because the technique is bad, it's just because they haven't trained it in a way that that makes it work. Um, They haven't trained enough sparring. They haven't trained with enough resistance. They they haven't improved their fitness enough. They haven't haven't developed timing and speed and power and, and control of distance. So... Uh, that's the main reason that a lot of the schools don't compete is because they don't want to find out that they're at the bottom. Uh, so it's much easier to put our head in the sand and say, well, we're not sport and, and try to make it a point of pride when in reality it should be a, a point of you know, embarrassment that we don't compete. So look, I actively encourage my Krav Maga students to compete in everything. Uh, if I've got a Krav Maga student who has a, a heart for boxing and wants to box and you know what I'm going to help him find somewhere to box if they if they want to grapple then I'll find places for him to grapple and and I still actively compete across as, as many different styles as I possibly can so um, I, I'm big on competition and it, look, even if you even if you're not into competition and not everyone is competitively minded and that's that's totally cool at the very least be actively engaging people from outside your system outside your immediate network and and grow and put the students needs first so as a prospective student looking at a school that's one of the things i'll be looking at is do they bring in outsiders or do they test themselves in competition to at least get some validation that what they're doing is working Uh, and and look when when we're talking about realistic self-defense the validation that it's working can sometimes be hard to come come about Uh, we we might have a pretty good idea that what we're doing is good and that uh, it it makes sense but uh, unless you live in a really bad area and your students are constantly being jumped and assaulted and, uh, and fighting for their lives, then you don't get a lot of immediate feedback on whether what you're doing is working. Uh, you hope it is, you hope it will, but you also hope that you won't have to find out all that often. So competition is a good proxy for that. Uh, at least if you can see that your students are doing fairly well for themselves in um, yeah, pancration or kudo or... Uh, amateur Muay Thai or, or, or a grappling industries competition or whatever, then you at least have some validation that your training methodologies work. Uh, as long as they're not kicking people in the nuts while they're doing it, yeah, that's that's the important thing. So that's a, a good proxy for um, yeah, for not living in a war zone, I guess. And the final point, this is, this is a very important one as well. In fact, they're all important. That's why they're there. But the final point, uh, which I, I'll use as the take-home point, is... The instructor is prepared to meet you where you're at and assist you on your journey. So this is a this is an individual thing for the instructor. Uh, and again, it doesn't matter what style it is. It doesn't matter what uniform you're wearing. If the instructor is interested in you as the human being and taking you from where you are now to the utmost levels of your potential, then that is a good instructor. If the instructor is interested in fitting you into a cookie-cutter mold and making you into the same as every other black belt he's got. Uh, that's not going to work out long term because everybody's a little bit different. If you're coming into martial arts as a uh, 31-year-old mum of three kids, then what you your journey over the next five years is going to look like is going to be different to a 17-year-old boy who's coming out of high school and um, is interested in... Uh, in, in fighting competitions and, and winning trophies. You know, it's just it's just going to be different. So a good instructor is able to read where students are at, get to know them, understand their, their goals and aspirations and also their fears and limitations, and then build training around making them as good as they can possibly be 
and getting them as safe as they can possibly get them. So that might mean that I've got a class of 15 students and I know that over here I've got my five gung-ho, ready to tackle the world, let's get punched in the face and get after it, guys, and that's cool. And then I might have another five that are a little bit more timid and a little bit unsure and still trying to find their feet and they really just wanted the workout, they didn't really want to get into the whole violence thing and that's fine too. And then I might have another cluster that are somewhere in the middle of all that and they're a little bit more confident but still a bit concerned about the contact or they I've got some that really like doing the talking stuff and some that really like doing the physical stuff and I've got some that really just kind of don't want to do anything because they've had a really rough day at work and all those things are on me as an instructor to be able to manage to make sure the class is as interesting and as fulfilling for my for my students as it possibly can be without leaving anyone behind so when i look at an individual student uh like a like a new prospect i want to know who they are as an individual because i want to know i want to get a feel for where can they go to I don't want to know, can they conform to my cookie-cutter opinion of what a black belt should look like in five years from now. That's not important. What's important is, where are they now, where can I get them to, and how am I going to get them there? And if your instructor isn't interested in that, isn't interested in you as an individual and as a human being, and is more interested in whether you've signed your direct debit forms and whether you uh, are going to buy the uniform and whether you're going to... um, fit the mold of what he's looking for then that's probably not the right instructor for you and you're best off continue looking so that wraps up point 12 so just to revise the points 1 through 12 number one the instructor teaches self-defense as a priority number two the instructor has some understanding of real violence number three the instructor understands self-defense law and teaches multiple force options as appropriate number four Most students appear to be in decent shape. Number five, drills involve contact. Number six, classes include sparring. Number seven, all ranges of combat are taught to some level. Number eight, drills and scenarios resemble reality and include realistic variables. Number nine, at least some portion of the class is spent actively training pre-contact skills. Number 10, The instructor talks at least occasionally about post-contact incident management. Number 11, the instructor or academy, sorry, the instructor or academy actively seeks to learn from the outside and or test themselves in competition. And lastly, number 12, the instructor is prepared to meet you where you're at and assist you on your personal journey. So I hope you've got something out of that. If you're looking for a martial arts school, uh, yeah, feel free to, uh, to write those down or print them out I'll, I'll, I'll try to knock up a blog post in the next couple of days to, to marry up with this so that you can uh, you can print it out and you can then go and check off your list as you're, as you're visiting martial arts schools if you're in Melbourne uh, please be aware my classes kick off in Epping at Story Martial Arts uh, from 5th of February we resume classes so if you're in Melbourne and you want to train with me uh, check it out at www.melbournecrav.com.au that's melbournekrav.com.au. All the details will be there. Thank you very much for listening. Uh, I've really enjoyed doing this episode. Uh, I think it's uh, we've covered some good material. Uh, should be back next week with another guest. I've got quite a few big names lined up, so uh, don't fall asleep on that because we, we've got some big ones. Until then, stay safe, and uh, I'll talk to you soon. You've been listening to the Managing Violence Podcast with Joe Saunders. As always, for more information on any of the topics covered, you can visit www.progressivedefense.com.au. And to support the work we do, please visit www.patreon.com forward slash Joe PD.